I wanted to start with this because offline a moment ago, Tony, we were talking about how a lot of traditional things are done in the whole sporting world. And coaches are simply doing things in practice that are not helping their teams to win. And this goes to any sport. Could you speak a little bit to that and just some of the things you've observed as an industry leader over the last decade or so? I, I What I've observed, and I, I've read this before, is that change is seldom, if ever, top down. That, that it usually is bottom up, whether it's political or coaching or education. And, and what happens is the the leaders of industry, of whether it's basketball, NBA, or college track and field, um, they hire assistant coaches who need to be vertically aligned, which means they all have to be on the same page, and they all have to buy in and, and believe in the program. So basically, you have this year after year after year brainwashing of young talent who basically is that they're just parroting the head coach. And so what happens is that what we were doing 50 years ago, uh, not only are we repeating the problems and, and, the, and the bad things that we do, but in my opinion, maybe we've even gotten worse because, because we're like reading from some ancient script that should have been thrown out a long time ago. That's so well put. And I think it's fascinating because obviously, yes, you're in track and field, but the work you've done, you've actually done a lot of work in multiple sports and all of it applies to basketball. And I think what I wanted to start at is maybe the the lowest hanging fruit, which is conditioning. And it's unfortunately something we see still see a lot in basketball, especially early season where coaches, you know, will really run their teams into the ground and do a lot of conditioning drills, which actually have no relevance to basketball. And obviously your approach is the opposite to that. And I think, could you touch on, you know, why some of these practices are so harmful and actually not conducive to good player development? Well, I, I say that everything I talk about seems to be counterintuitive. It, it, I, I understand Steph Curry, you know, he, he runs 2.7 miles in every game. And so intuitively, you would think we need to run him maybe three miles a day or six miles a day even in the off season. But we don't want basketball players to resemble marathon runners. We want them to be athletic and conditioning. I'm talking about traditional conditioning, miserable, fatigue seeking, um, highly aerobic stuff detrains athleticism and and i always want to define athleticism and that's sprint fast lift heavy jump high jump far and bounce and if if we start running six miles a day we will lose those qualities and so people say well how how can he play 34 minutes in a game without doing all this conditioning and what I have found is that good athletes really don't tire very quickly, that you want to be athletic and fresh and rested and recovered, and that tired is the enemy. Always, always, always. I've actually witnessed basketball practices that began with conditioning, thinking that somehow that doing fundamentals in a fatigued state would help them in the fourth quarter. And I don't know if there's anything dumber in, in the world than pre-fatiguing practice. And, and then I go back, my dad was a basketball coach. And the one thing that he really got right was that they did not shoot free throws tired. They learn skills when fresh. And that's because the brain does not learn when it's sluggish. It does not learn when it's jet lagged. It does not learn when it's tired. So truly you know feed the cats program you do away with all traditional conditioning and you you prioritize athleticism and you do things in practice that wins games yeah that's it and i think for me tony the biggest thing which i've taken from you over the last two years and i've been saying it a lot ever since that breakfast is tired is the enemy and that's that's a slogan i've been using a lot because it's still something the basketball world doesn't understand i mean 
I want to come back to feed the cats in a moment. I'm going to go into the specifics of what it actually is and your ideas there. But let's take this in the context because a, a lot of NCA coaches, for instance, would still be doing mile runs and and all of that stuff. But I'd say even now in the present day in Europe, European basketball, where you know professional basketball is the highest level outside the NBA, it's common to still see coaches doing two practices a day. So very common. And it's really surprising with all the advancements and everything we know in sports science. So why is that actually a problem? And and what can we do to maybe get coaches understanding the importance of this message? Yeah, I, I my mind goes back to track and field. Uh, one of the most aggressive things in track and field are the hurdles. And if we have a hurdler that had a tough workout in the morning or the day before, he is fatigued. Uh, he went through a fatiguing warm up. He has to take off after eight steps to clear the first hurdle. And it's not easy. He also needs to be able to, to take off seven feet before the first hurdle. That's, that's like two meters. So in order to cover two meters in the air, you have to be at a very high speed. Well, if there's anything that is causing you to have poor fundamentals or uh, or not be fast to that first hurdle, your only other option is to maybe take nine steps to the first hurdle, which will just get you beat every single time. So when you're learning a, a skill like shooting, passing, dribbling, playing defense, all those things need to be done as fresh as possible. And one of the things I think that basketball coaches get wrong, and my father got it wrong, was that he said that practices need to be so hard that the games become easy. And so I am counterintuitive. I, I, I say the opposite. If every traditional coach knows that the day after a game, you probably should give the guys a day off. But what happens if the four practices before that game were harder than the game itself? And you didn't give them time off. That's an endless spiral towards fatigue and detraining athleticism. And so I'm a huge believer in a four-day work week. I'm a huge believer, of course, in no conditioning. I, I'm a huge believer that anytime we reduce practice time, we make practice better. Yeah. That quality will automatically go up. Uh, I, I still, it was 50 years ago, but I can still remember as a player coasting in the first half of practice and being tired in the second half because practice was so brutal. I mean, practice was three times the volume of a game. And I think that practice volumes need to never exceed 50 to 60% of game volume. That's great. Thanks for sharing that, Tony. I think it's 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 really interesting because obviously a lot of the stuff, when, when we first spoke about this, it really resonated because obviously everything I'm doing looking at how we can practice with decisions using the constraint set approach. And it just aligns perfectly because it's, you know, within the practice, it doesn't mean that we can't have a really efficient, effective practice, but it's, it's less is more. And it's a lot of times, I mean, working at different levels, even last year with Paris basketball, we were playing in the Euro cup, second highest level of European basketball. Sometimes we would do practice. It would be like an hour or an hour 10. And it's, if you get everything in that, 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 that you need, and you've done it, you don't need to keep doing more. And, and that's why it makes so much sense.